In the ancient ages, the great Hebrew prophets predicted that before the coming of their promised Messiah, there would come specific signs or what would amount to the fulfillment of their prophecies that would signal the end of the age. Over each successive millennium, the nations throughout the world have pondered exactly when those times would come, looking forward and were it possible to even hasten those days. But not until the Jews returned to the land in 1948 could those signs become evident and clearly seen. Today, after some 50 years back in the land, those signs have become crystal clear even to the casual observer. From the mountains flowing with sweet wine, to the wars of the Jews, to the rebuilding of the third Jewish temple, to the sealed eastern gate and much more, you will experience and see it all as 25 Messianic Signs brings to you the unfolding drama of the prophetic signs that point to the unparalleled and momentous event of our time, the return of the Messiah. While the world sleeps, distracted by the mundane and day-to-day -day chores of this life, one of the world's greatest marvels goes virtually unnoticed, the return of the Jews to the Promised Land. Over the past 50 years, the prophetic drama has played out and continues to unfold, yet, for the most part, the world seems to be blinded to this remarkable miracle. When the Romans destroyed the temple in Jerusalem, the holy city, in 70 AD, the Jews were scattered to the four winds and the distant corners of the earth as vagabonds amongst the nations of the world, living everywhere but their hallowed and promised land. But after nearly 2,000 years of disenfranchisement from their homeland, and according to their ancient prophets' predictions, at the end of the age, they would once again return home. This remarkable and unprecedented phenomena would not only fulfill prophecy, but would serve as a universal sign to all the nations that the end of the age was at hand. Well, that was quite a trip through the city, but we made it, and I'm here with my distinguished colleague and dear friend, Dr. Noah Hutchins. Dr. Hutchins has been to, the, to Israel over 40 times. In fact, he's lost count. He's done over a hundred, written over 100 books, and he's a, a great historian. He writes on biblical prophecy. He loves the Jewish people. And uh, Dr. Hutchins, it's just wonderful to be with you here tonight at the Wailing Wall of all places, one of the most holy places in all of Israel. Uh, to experience the Shabbat. It's going to be Sabbath here in about 30 minutes. We're going to have to stop filming because they make us shut down the camera before the Shabbat officially starts. But Noah, what, what, uh, what is it like for you? You've been here many times, coming to this place, feeling the people on a night like this. What goes through your heart and mind in a time like this? Uh, of course, I uh, remember uh, the many uh, journeys. I've been here to Israel, the many uh, thousands of people who I brought over here to see this land to see what God is doing in this land. I also remember uh, the many prophecies that have been fulfilled here so far. Of course, the first one I think of, uh, of course, is the fig tree, the parable of the fig tree. That is certainly true. Jesus said uh, of the fig tree, when the fig tree buds. But it is just like uh, Christ said, that uh, Israel would be like a fig tree, or a fig tree would be a symbol or representative or a parable as it were, a sign that there would be this coming, this return of the Jews to the land. And so we're seeing it tonight as we look over our shoulder at the Wailing Wall and we see them gathering for the Shabbat. 
It, it, we're, it's, a, it's as though we're seeing prophecy fulfilled before our eyes. The fig tree certainly has budded. It, right before our eyes, we're watching it. That is a major sign right. of his coming again. Exactly. Or the coming of Israel's Messiah. Of course, uh, as Christians, we know Jesus Christ as the Messiah who will come again. But the Jews don't know yet that uh, Jesus Christ is the Messiah, or they don't recognize their Messiah, profess to know who their Messiah will be yet. But we know according to Zechariah, one day they will know. But the fig tree has budded again. And we uh, know that Jesus said, uh, when the fig tree buds, know that his coming was near. Uh, that was in Matthew, but in Luke he also said, Behold the fig tree when it buds, and all the trees. Mm. And that in itself is remarkable yes, prophecy. Yes, really. Because uh, after Israel became a nation, the uh, colonial system was broken up. Nations increased from 70 to 200. So all the trees budded mm. again. That in itself is remarkable prophecy. Yes, it is. And then uh, he said uh, the Jews would come back. You know, he, first, he said they would first come back from the east. And uh, in 1900, there were uh, several uh, million Jews in the countries of the Middle East, in Morocco, in Turkey, in Libya, in Syria. When Saddam Hussein came to power, he hung eight Jews on the streets of uh, Baghdad saying, Jews, go home. And then uh, persecution arose in uh, Turkey and in uh, Libya and in Morocco and in Algeria and in Sudan. And so they came out first, as uh, the prophet said they would, uh, from the east. And then he said uh, they would come back from the west. And look what happened in the west, uh, in Europe. World War II, the right. Holocaust, killing of over six million Jews. And a million and a half of those were children. It was one of the most terrible things. And uh, you know, Daniel said, uh, the Messiah would come when the transgressors would come to the full. And you know where there have been many evil rulers in the past. We can go all the way back to Genghis Khan, Attila the Hun, uh, Napoleon, the Caesar, Hitler. In my lifetime, we have seen the transgressors come to the full. There's been no greater transgressor than Adolf Hitler. Right. And we think of Stalin, who was given credit for killing over a million Jews. Speaking of Stalin, the third place where they came from was from the north, which was from Russia. That is certainly true. It looked like that uh, the Jews were not going to get to come back from the north. And, you know, we read in uh, Ezekiel 20 that when God did a miracle to bring these Jews back, he would do it with a mighty hand right. and a stretched out arm. And he said the last place they would come back would be from the south. The Ethiopian Jews. It was in uh, 1990 right. that suddenly Ethiopia said, if you want these uh, Felicia Jews, these black Jews, then you come down and get them. Right. So we've uh, seen this whole prophecy fulfilled right before our eyes in this century. In every detail. Amazing. And we're seeing the culmination of it this evening here right. at the Wailing Wall. Yeah. And then, of course, out of the Holocaust and World War II, uh, the UN came, and then in one day, 1948, uh, the, the nation was born in one day. That is right. We read in Isaiah 66, who has heard such a thing, shall a nation be born in a day. And here these Jews came back from all over the world, not knowing each other, under different political systems, uh, speaking different languages, uh, and all at once, after 2,000 years, they became a nation again. Who has heard such a thing as this ever happening, as Isaiah said? And said, surely this is a sign. So we are to look at the, what God is doing and knowing that all the prophecies has been fulfilled, that what few remains will be fulfilled. You know, I've been here a couple of times, Noah, and I love Friday night here because there's, it's almost like you can see the Shekinah glory of God. If, if you've never been to Israel, if you've never been to Jerusalem, uh, there really is a presence of God over these people. I don't think they recognize it as such, but you can almost feel it. Unless you're here to, to, to experience it, you just don't know. But I love coming here just to experience the joy and the worship they, they put forward here. The, they, they dance down at the Wailing Wall, and it's, qu it's quite an experience to be here. As the Jews have been coming back into the land, 
uh, and it's been born in one day. There was some things happening prior to 1948 where there was the buying back of the land. Could you, uh, could you comment on that? When the Jews returned to this land, uh, they would not come back with a mighty army. They would have to come back and buy the land piece by piece. And uh, the Rothschilds and uh, Jewish bankers and uh, the rich Jews from around the world, those that had money, contributed. And uh, they gave the uh, Jewish immigrants money to come back and actually buy back the land from uh, the uh, Palestinian owners or foreign owners who own the land here, and they established the kibbutz system. And out of the kibbutz system, after so many years, there came this nation in 1948. And uh, they came back uh, speaking all these languages, and uh, we read that, that when they uh, come back that God would restore to them a pure language. We are told that uh, even those who came back uh, from Ethiopia would have to learn the language. And you, you go through Israel here, you see the black or the flash of Jews from Ethiopia, and uh, they, they just fitted right into the culture here. You see them in the army, you see them in, uh, as merchants, as clerks, and uh, the Ethiopian, as uh, Nahum promised. Uh, Eliezer ben Yehuda, of course, was a, a patriotic Jew, and he perceived that this nation was kind of like Babel. He got a law passed through the Knesset that uh, Hebrew would be the official language of Israel, and, and it is, and as you go through, uh, everyone speaks Hebrew. All the signs here are in Hebrew. So there are so many prophecies here in Israel that have been fulfilled. But not only did they bring back a pure language, but they also returned to the use of the shekel. That is certainly true, because uh, we read that uh, when they come back in the land, uh, I believe it's in Ezekiel, in order to be ready to resume temple worship and give their offering and shekels as commanded under the law, when they came back in the land and the nation was refounded, they would again return to the shekel. And uh, when they first come back in the land, they were using the English pound and the dollar and a few other currencies here. And it was not convenient at all. So they got a law passed through the Knesset that uh, the shekel would be the official currency. So if you go to a store, they'll make you change your money into shekels if you want to purchase something. And, they and still may take a dollar, but the uh, official Yeah, the uh, official money currency, is, they'd rather have shekels. Right. And some stores do not take any currency but the shekel. Mm -hmm. And it's uh, more economical to go ahead and convert to the shekel and just trade in shekels. Yeah. And all the uh, prices here in Israel are given in shekels. Hmm. So as uh, the prophet said, uh, they've returned to the shekel. And when the Messiah comes, they will uh, give their offerings again in, in shekels. It's an exciting time to be alive. It is, it is. Well, uh, we're, we're really delighted to be with you and share these moments with you. But we're going to go out across the land now and experience some of the other prophecies that we'll see throughout this wonderful miracle land of Israel. No, when I was a little kid going to the Jewish temple before I became a Christian, uh, they would have these drives where they would encourage us to raise money so that we could plant trees here in Israel. And now as we're here in this forest, I'm amazed that some of these trees are 60 feet high. It's amazing what's happened in this land. And you know, Ken, uh, the constituents of our ministry have planted two forests here in Israel. But the amazing thing about these trees here is that, uh, you know, uh, Isaiah prophesied that this land would be a wilderness during the absence of the Jews from the land. That uh, actually happened. During the diaspora, there were no trees in Israel. The entire uh, land was denuded of any trees. And then uh, Isaiah said when the Israeli people began to come back in this land, that he would plant in this wilderness the pine tree, the myrtle tree, the fir tree, and he goes on to name all kind of trees, some that had never grown here in this land before. 
and you can look around here and, and what did you see? You see huge trees all over the country. The mountains are covered, the valleys. And what kind of trees? Well, there's all the trees that uh, Isaiah mentioned. There must be six or seven varieties right in this one spot where we're standing. A at least. And Isaiah said, when the nations see all these trees on the mountains and valleys of Israel, they are to know that he is doing this and preparing to fulfill his messianic promises to his covenant people. This very special place, the Mount of Beatitudes, is where the Lord gave his greatest sermon, the Sermon on the Mount. It wasn't far from here that he fed the 5,000, he walked on water, he even did the miracle at the marriage supper of Cana. He cast out demons, he healed people, he did a lot of miracles in this place in Galilee, and yet for all that he did, it was still almost impossible for people to believe in him. As a result of their unbelief in this area, Jesus said that these three cities, Capernaum, Bethsaida, and Chorazim, would never be inhabited again. He pronounced a curse, a woe upon these three cities. And they have not been rebuilt, even though the other cities of Israel have been rebuilt. And he also said that in the day of judgment, Sodom would fare better than these three cities, which it has. If you were to visit the southern end of the Dead Sea, you would see the little city of Sodom there where the chemical works are. So this is another remarkable fulfillment of the messianic signs here in the Holy Land. Another amazing messianic prophecy is found in Ezekiel. Ezekiel prophesied that when Israel was gathered back in the land out of all countries in the last days, that uh, the cities would be renamed after their old estate. Of course, when Israel was absent from the land, foreign conquerors were here. Uh, the Romans, the Turks, and uh, other uh, conquerors lived here and uh, each uh, new conqueror would rename the cities. But as we travel through Israel today, Jerusalem, it's renamed Jerusalem, Nazareth is Nazareth, Bethlehem is Bethlehem, Beersheba is Beersheba, and even this little village behind me where Jesus raised the widow's son, Nain, has been named again Nain. So this particular messianic prophecy has come to pass even in our day. Another important uh, messianic prophecy in Israel today concerns the restoration of the fruitfulness of the land. Moses uh, told Israel that God had uh, instructed him that uh, he had given them a good land, a wonderful land, a land flowing with milk and honey that would provide everything they would need. But in uh, Deuteronomy 29, he warned them that if they departed from the commandments of God and wandered after false religions or other idols, that uh, the land would become as Sodom and Gomorrah. Barren and the nations of the world would wonder why God would bring such judgment against a nation like this. In 1865, Mark Twain visited Israel, and he wrote back that this land is so barren and desolate, nothing grows here, there is no grass, there is no trees, there is no fruit in the land, there is no vegetables. Why anyone would ever want to live in this land is more than I can understand. But then the Jews began to return to the land. When the Jew is in the land, it produces an abundance of vegetables and fruit. But when the Jew is absent from the land, it becomes barren and desolate. And as the Jews began to return to the land, the land again began to produce. Today, as you go to Israel, you see fruits of every kind in the world. You see nuts, 
I was raised in Oklahoma and on the farm, and we uh, grew cotton, and if we made one bale to the acre, we thought we had good cotton. But uh, out by the airport and up and down the Jezreel Valley, you can see cotton that produces three bales to the acre. And uh, by the way, we're at Carmel Market here in Tel Aviv. It's a huge market, uh, probably between a quarter square mile and a half a square mile. Probably close to 200 acres in this market filled with fruit of every kind and uh, huge fruit. And uh, I have in my hand here an avocado. Not long ago, avocados didn't grow in Israel. So they went to the United States and brought back some avocado cuttings and seed, and they developed avocados here that surpass anything we have. This is an avocado almost as big as a grapefruit. And then they had to convince the Europeans that they needed to eat avocados, which they did. And now they ship these avocados to Europe and all over the world because they're so superior to the avocados that we have in the United States. We uh, again point to the prophecy of Isaiah that when Israel returned to the land, it would no longer be barren and desolate, but it would again be bountiful and fill the whole world with fruit. And this is just another example of the fulfillment of Isaiah's prophecy that the land would blossom and bud again when Israel returned to the land. This is the military fortress of Gamala. It was here that 5,000 Jewish zealots valiantly defended Israel and successfully fought off the invading Roman army. But on a secondary advance by the Romans, when it was no longer possible to withstand the enormous numbers of invaders, some 5,000 brave warriors commit suicide, leaping to their deaths from the pinnacle of the rock fortress. Now, this historic site has become one of Israel's most celebrated animal reserves, and the most visible animal is the griffin vulture. On observing these majestic birds, one gets the sense that they have been summoned to redeem the honor of the fallen Jewish warriors, awaiting to exact revenge on foreign invaders that trespass into the covenant land. Strangely, we know that according to scripture, Numbers of birds of prey will accumulate in this area, awaiting a great feast of human flesh that will fall to the ground in the Valley of Jezreel in Megiddo during the outbreak of the Battle of Armageddon. These birds of prey are perhaps the first arrivals. Well, Gamla Nature Reserve is one of the most beautiful places in Israel. You can see uh, it's the biggest colony of birds of prey in Israel. It's uh, the biggest colony not only by the number of individuals, but also by the numbers of different species breeding and roosting in, this, in the cliffs of Gamla Canyon. Uh, the major, the dominant raptor here is the griffon vultures. There's 120 individuals living here in these uh, cliffs. But there's also, you can find also the Egyptian vultures, the long-legged buzzard, the Bunelli eagle, the short-toed eagle, the kestrel, the eagle owl, and few other species that are migrating through this area. Uh, besides the raptors, uh, Gamla is very rich in its wildlife. Uh, you can find here the ibex, the gazelle, uh, the wolves, the foxes, porcupine, hedgehogs, and the uh, Syrian rock hyrax. Uh, it's almost uh, all the variety of wildlife in Israel can be found here in this small area of Gamla. In addition to the return of the birds of prey, according to scripture, we know that as we approach the Millennium Kingdom, there will also be a return of the biblical animals to the land. In the Golan Heights, not far from the Gamala Game Reserve, is a highly traveled tourist attraction called the Golan Heights Winery. While for most visitors, it's the novelty of the sweet wine that attracts them, but something much deeper lies at the significance of this winery. According to Joel 317, there will come a time at or very near the end of the age as we know it, when God would arise to judge those nations that lifted their hand against Israel. Proclaim this among the nations. 
Prepare a war, rouse the mighty men. Let all the soldiers come near, let them come up and hasten and come all you surrounding nations, for there I will sit to judge all the surrounding nations. Then it goes on to say that the Lord is the refuge for his people and a stronghold to the sons of Israel. And it will be a time as this that you will know that I am the Lord dwelling in my holy mountain, Jerusalem. But most significantly is that accompanying that time of judgment will be the messianic prophecy that the mountains of Israel will drip with sweet wine. Today in the mountains of Israel we see the partial fulfillment of the scripture in the Golan Heights winery, which is just one of many wineries located in, of all places, the mountains of Israel. Much of the wine is not fermented, but is the non-alcoholic essence of the sweetness of the grapes. Truly, the mountains of Israel are literally dripping with sweet wine. Could the balance of the scripture, which is the promise of the avenging of the innocent blood of Jews, blood that according to scripture has never been avenged throughout the ages, be just at hand? Remember, the sign will be the invasion by the surrounding nations. Egypt will become a waste and Edom will become a desolation because of the violence done to the house of Israel. Although Petra was the capital city of Edom, Edom itself incorporated vast portions of land to the north, to the east, and to the south, including most of Saudi Arabia. These are the principal lands that confess the name of Allah as God. Genesis 49 predicts that Messiah will one day wash his garments in the blood of grapes. Could the meaning be that the prophecies have finally triumphed and God and his name are fully vindicated? As we stand here in Petra, with the Roman theater in the background, we are reminded of one of the most amazing messianic prophecies in the Bible. The prophet Amos said that in the days that God would restore the tabernacle of David, Israel would possess the remnant of Edom. Now, where are the remnant of Edom today? Well, we know that the descendants of Esau, the Edomites, lived in this place until about 600 B.C. The Babylonians came in and moved them into Israel, and the Nabataeans came up from Arabia and dwelt in this place. But we read in the uh, Psalms that when uh, the Babylonians destroyed Jerusalem, the Edomites were there to encourage them. But even when Israel came back from captivity out of Babylon, the Edomites were in the land. Now, in 70 AD, when Rome destroyed Jerusalem and the temple, subsequently scattered the Jews into all nations, the Edomites remained in the land. So we would assume, therefore, that the Palestinians in Israel today have a Edomite heritage. The prophecy is that when the Messiah comes, Israel will possess the remnant of Edom and the Messiah will settle all these racial differences that plague this land even to this day. We're here on, in the foothills of the Golan Heights, and you cannot imagine what Israel has done to this land, which was once nothing but rocks and nothing growing here at all. This is the cornfield, and we're here the latter part of August. And this is not Oklahoma or Iowa. This is in Israel. Here it is, the latter part of August, Nobody plants corn or grows corn in August, except they do here in Israel. And look at this corn, two and three ears on every stalk. It's the most amazing thing. And again, we remember what the Bible says. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that the plowman shall overtake the reaper 
and the credder of grapes, him that soweth seed. There has been only one grain crop per year in Israel prior to the 20th century. Therefore, it was an amazing prophecy that Amos made concerning continual crop rotation that would occur in Israel at the time the tabernacle of David would be restored, or meaning the dawning of the Messianic Age. Israel has the most technically computerized system of irrigation in the world. But can we believe that even this kind of irrigation is prophesied in the Bible? Of course, increased rainfall has helped to make this continual seasonal growing of vegetables and grain crops in Israel partially possible, but the main reason is the highly computerized system of irrigation that has been developed. This type of irrigation in Israel today saves water by putting it to the plant's roots and making possible the planting of seed and crop rotation even in 110 to 120 degree weather. So just as Amos prophesied, in Israel today you will see workers gathering on one side of a field, plowing in the middle, and planting on the far side. We are now in the Kidron Valley, and behind us is the Golden Gate, also called the Eastern Gate. The Eastern Gate uh, figures prominently in the prophetic word. Now, we might uh, wonder why a closed gate would have any prophetic significance. Well, when Jesus would come over the Mount of Olives down through the Kidron Valley, and uh, he would go uh, through the Eastern Gate into the Temple Mount, because that was the nearest route. There was no reason why he would go through any other gate. We read in Ezekiel 44 that this gate, the eastern gate, would be closed and it would not be opened uh, again until the prince returned. Now, Shulman the Great built the walls and the gate. The original eastern gate was destroyed and Shulman the Great in about 1550 sealed this gate evidently to keep uh, Christian pilgrims from going through it. And uh, the Jordanian guards have even stationed uh, a sentry on the other side of the gate unless somebody should open that gate. And the uh, Muslims have even put a cemetery in front of the gate because Jesus is high, our high priest and no high priest would go through a graveyard. So uh, that gate is to be closed until Jesus returns, it has not been opened, and it will not be opened until he comes again. His feet will stand upon the Mount of Olives. He will again come down through the Kidron Valley. He will enter in the Eastern Gate into Jerusalem, and he will be declared to be King of Kings and Lord of Lords. The Diaspora, or scattering of Israel in 70 AD, and her subsequent return in 1948, is one of history's most stunning occurrences. Almost every Old Testament prophet said they would be scattered into all the world for a period of time and then brought back. Jesus Christ said they would be scattered into all the world and Jerusalem would be trodden down the Gentiles until the times the Gentiles be fulfilled. That the Jews were going to be scattered into all the world and then brought back is one of the most amazing prophecies uh, the world has ever seen. No other religious book in the world can make such prophecies except the Bible. But I want to note the prophecy of Hosea on this subject because it gives us the duration of the diaspora. For the children of Israel shall remain many days without a king or a prince and without a temple. They have had no temple, they have had no king, they have not even had a prince. Then shall the children return and seek the Lord and David their king, and fear the Lord and his goodness in the latter days. In the next chapter it says, I will go and return to my place till they, Israel, acknowledge their offense 
and seek my face. In their affliction or their tribulation, they will seek me early. So we refer this to Jesus Christ who came. He was rejected. He returned to his place. But in the tribulation, they will come to know him. And we continue on, Come and let us return unto the Lord, for he hath torn, and he will heal us. He hath smitten, and he will bind us up, which he will. After two days will he revive us, and the third day, then shall we know, if we follow on to know the Lord, his going forth is prepared as the morning, and he will come unto us as the rain, and the latter rain, and the former rain unto the earth. So we read here that after two days, God would bring them back. It's obvious that this is not two 24-hour days. And we read in Psalm 90 and also 2 Peter that one day is with the Lord is a thousand years or two thousand years. Now how long has Israel been dispersed into the world? Two thousand years. Now they're back. This in itself proves that we're living at the dawning of the Messianic age. And not only that, the indication is the Messiah will come when the latter and the former reigns have been restored. And we're in that area now. The former and latter rains in Israel has been restored and rainfall in Israel has doubled since 1948. So this is one of the most amazing prophecies in the Bible. Not only did Hosea tell about the diaspora, he mentioned that it would last for 2,000 years and the Messiah would come at the end of the 2,000 years when the former and latter rain had been restored unto the earth. So this is an exciting prophecy. And we see it coming to pass right here before our eyes. Uh, we're here in front of the Knesset in Jerusalem, uh, visiting with our guide, uh, Gila Trevis, who has been a uh, guide for my tours here in Israel many, many years. And uh, Gila, concerning the Knesset, uh, we know that Hosea and others uh, prophesied that Israel would be without a king and without a temple many, many years. But when they came back in the land, no mention really is made of an immediate king, but there are mentions of governors. Now, does that mean that Israel is, is a democracy? Is that, would that be a fulfillment of the prophetic word? Well, Israel definitely is a democracy. In fact, boy, what a democracy. You could say that we suffer from excess democracy because every elections, which are supposed to be every four years, we have 30 political parties coming up for elections. Even the ultra-religious factions of Muslims and Jews have representation. And so the Jewish government is not even close to the monarchical system of old. But today, it is governed by a configuration of political parties or governors, just as scripture foretells. The Jewish preparations for the rebuilding of the temple is one of the chief and most thrilling messianic signs of our day. Today in Israel, the Temple Mount Institute is actively preparing for the temple's reconstruction. The Temple Institute is dedicated to the concept of the positive commandment that Israel is entrusted with to rebuild the Holy Temple in every generation. Essentially, our goal is to try to fulfill this commandment of, and you shall make for me a sanctuary that I will dwell among you, as best as possible. The main focal point of our work is the actual restoration of the vessels that can be used in the temple. And these things are not models or replicas or copies, but are actually real, made according to the exact requirements of the biblical law, according to every nuance of the way God gave it over to Moses, as embellished also in the oral tradition. So these things can actually be used in the rebuilt temple. Uh, to date, we've constructed over three quarters of the vessels that are necessary for the restoration of temple service. Now, one of the uh, major questions that are always uh, asked is, um, where is the temple going to be rebuilt? So, of course, the temple doesn't go in Cincinnati or Paris, but a few meters in this direction on the Temple Mount. And that, of course, is not uh, my idea or your idea, but something that God chose, the only place on earth that God chose to rest his presence. It's difficult, really, for many people to comprehend and to understand 
you know, to fathom how this is going to come about considering the geopolitical reality of the situation as we have it today. The temple is going to be rebuilt. That's not the problem. I know the end of the movie. We all know that the temple is going to be rebuilt because that's a divine promise. So the issue is not really the stones. But again, on the other hand, I can't shy from the fact that that's where the temple belongs and that's where it goes and that's the destiny of the Jewish people. How it's going to come about is something else entirely. And I think that when we study the prophets of Israel, we begin to see that the major hallmark of that era is that it's a very special time of harmony and unity and peace. All that we can really do is have the faith and integrity to live as Jews should live, right. to adhere to the Word of God and to do as best as possible that which is incumbent upon us to bring us closer to the time of the Temple. You know, it's very interesting that here in Israel, you cannot uh, travel along any major road, any major highway, even one mile without running across some place or some site or some memorial or some location that does not have a contemporary prophetic relationship. Now, we're standing here in a armored unit uh, memorial. Uh, this building uh, in the background was once an old uh, British fort and British headquarters for their military police. But the tanks uh, that you see all around me are tanks that have been used in the wars of Israel from the Sherman tank up to Israel's latest tank, the chariot. And also in this uh, collection of tanks uh, as a memorial to the brave men who defended Israel in these past wars, uh, some tanks captured from the Egyptians, uh, the Syrians, the Iraqis, or other Arab nations that have come against Israel in these last days. What is even more uh, amazing as we read the uh, prophetic word in the 12th chapter of Zechariah, that all this was prophesied exactly over 2,500 years before it happened. For example, Zechariah predicted that when Israel would return to the land just before the Messiah came, that the armies of Israel would destroy vast armies of the enemy on the right and on the left. And this is exactly what has happened. On the right and on the left, Jordan, Syria, Iraq, and on the other side, there is Egypt. So the world military strategists are amazed that although outnumbered at times 30 to 1, Israel has won amazing wars. Israel today is still looking for their Messiah, but according to Zechariah, after these wars, Israel will know their Messiah. And my, what a glorious day that is, and what a remarkable remembrance of this coming event, or looking forward to this coming event, as we stand in the midst of all these tanks that have fought in so many of these battles that have saved the uh, nation of Israel from extinction. One of the reasons there can be no lasting peace in the Middle East until the Messiah comes is the controversy we see today over the city of Jerusalem. The status of Jerusalem is not just a political or national problem, it is a spiritual problem. The Vatican wants Jerusalem, the Jews claim Jerusalem, and rightly so, as their spiritual and national capital. The Islamic religious authority claims the Temple Mount as the third most holy place in Islam, and consequently disputes over the Jewish temple also infringes upon Jewish rights to the old city. Arafat claims the old city of Jerusalem, the Jerusalem recognized by God, as the capital for his new Palestinian state. The status of Jerusalem is debated daily in the United Nations and the capitals of the world. The prophet Zechariah foretold that when Israel came back into the land in the last days, 
that God would make Jerusalem a burdensome stone for all people. Zechariah chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. One of the reasons there is continual fighting over Jerusalem and no peace in the Middle East, as prophesied in Ezekiel 35, is that the Idumeans or Edomites, the descendants of Esau, who are today the present-day Palestinians, have a perpetual hatred for the Israelis, the descendants of Jacob. In the following chapter, in Ezekiel 36, we see Israel back in the land. The people have been gathered back from all nations, having to deal with enemies from without and enemies from within. As the prophet foretold, Jerusalem is a burdensome stone for all the world to bear, a sign that the messianic age is dawning and God is suddenly to intervene to settle this controversy and problem that dates all the way back to the time of Abraham, Esau, and Jacob. Since May 14, 1948, when the Israeli head of state, David Ben-Gurion, proclaimed the rebirth of the nation of Israel, that nation has been confronted with three major wars and six lesser wars. In addition, Israel has been on a continual war footing alert. Israel has had to invest much of its national budget and manpower in maintaining a large army. Israel needs peace, yet the mindset of the Islamic world has been, we can lose 99 wars, all we have to do is win the 100th war. Since 1948, there have been at least 50 UN resolutions and an international agreement to try to bring peace between Israel and its Arab neighbors, as well as with the Palestinian elements within its borders. Yet, not one of these treaties, resolutions, or agreements has brought any measure of peace to this part of the world. However, in Daniel 9.27, Jesus in the Olivet Discourse and Paul in Second Thessalonians all foretold that there would be a comprehensive peace treaty sign that would seemingly bring an uneasy peace for three and one half years. But then this peace accord or covenant would be broken with disastrous results leading to worldwide wars, desolations, and sorrow. This period will be the last half of the tribulation or the time of Jacob's trouble. According to the Bible, the man who will be the Antichrist will confirm or guarantee this peace treaty. Then he himself will break it and seek to finish the job that Hitler started, the liquidation of Israel as a race. Only the Messiah can bring peace, but these futile efforts to effect a comprehensive peace treaty between Israel and its neighbors by the UN, the United States, and the nations of the world is in itself only a messianic sign to get ready for the coming of the Lord. After Solomon's death, the nation was divided into two kingdoms, the southern kingdom, headquartered in Jerusalem under King Rehoboam, and the northern kingdom in Dan under King Jeroboam. This is the remains of the ancient city of Dan, way to the north of the Sea of Galilee. The Danites formerly lived between Jerusalem and Tel Aviv to the south, but they were raided by the Philistines from Gaza continuously, and so they moved north. But when they did, they exposed themselves 
to the teachings of Jeroboam and his idolatrous worship. And as a result of that, uh, they departed from the God of Israel and they morally decayed. And finally, God sent the Assyrians in to destroy them almost 150 years before the rest of the 10 tribes fell. After the division of Israel into two nations, Rehoboam reigned over the southern kingdom and Jeroboam reigned over the northern kingdom. Jeroboam reasoned now, if these people of the 10 tribes go back up to Jerusalem to worship at the temple at the feast days, and especially at the Passover, well, they're going to get attached back to the temple and Jerusalem and they'll go back to Rehoboam and they'll overthrow me and I have a big problem. So he reasoned that, now if I set up a golden calf here in Dan and one at Bethel, I can tell the people, why go back up to Jerusalem? It's a long road up there. And after all, it's so convenient to, for you to come to Dan and to uh, Bethel. And after all, we have these beautiful gods that our forefathers worshiped in Egypt. So uh, why, why go back up there? Here was the high place where the calf was set up, the golden calf. And down below was the altar. And Jeroboam became known as the man who made Israel to sin. Ezekiel the prophet refers to the separated kingdom as two separate sticks. But at the end of the age when Israel returns, the two sticks will be joined together to become one stick, as we read in Ezekiel 37, 22. And I will make of them one nation in the land upon the mountains of Israel, and shall no more be two nations neither shall they be divided into two kings any more at all. Just before the crucifixion of the Lord on Skull Hill, Roman soldiers cast lots and divided his garments here on the pavement of Herod's Antonia Fortress. But according to Revelation 16, Jerusalem will also be divided into thirds, most likely in a religious feeding frenzy between Islam, Judaism, and Catholicism. Although today Jerusalem is somewhat divided into Christian, Armenian, Muslim, and Jewish quarters, it is still presently under Israeli control with the exception of the Temple Mount, which for all practical purposes is under Jordanian authority. Now we know from statements and actions by Chairman Arafat that he has promised the Islamic world that old Jerusalem would be the capital of a new Palestinian state. Also, the Catholic Church evidently has designs of gaining control over at least one-third of Jerusalem. If Arafat gets a third, the Vatican gets a third, that would leave only one-third for Israel. The vast majority of political and religious leaders of Israel today would commit their nation to a war of finality rather than relinquish any right they have to the city of Jerusalem. However, in Revelation 16:19, there is an indication that Jerusalem will be divided into three parts. In any event, the Lord admonishes us in his word to pray for the peace of Jerusalem because when we pray for the peace of Jerusalem, we are actually praying for his glorious return because there can be no peace in Jerusalem until he does return. Well, no, one of the things that's so hard for me to deal with is after seeing all of these fulfilled prophecies, all these miracles in the land, the Jews still don't believe that uh, Jesus is Lord and that he's coming again. It's, it's amazing. Well, Ken, uh, really, you have uh, just given our 25th Messianic sign because uh, the Bible says that the Jews will not believe until the time of Jacob's troubles and their time of great affliction, and only then will they believe when they see the nail prints in his hand. So we know that all these signs certainly indicate 
that uh, that time is near at hand, as we read in Romans 11, that the Messiah will roar out of Zion, and all Israel shall be saved. Well, I think of the words of Christ himself when he said, when you see all of these things come to pass, you know that his coming is near. So I want to fulfill prophecy today, Noah, by saying, blessed is he, for all of Israel, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We hope you've enjoyed this tour of the Holy Land with us, of all these prophecies, and uh, you really can't appreciate it until you come here yourself. But we say from Jerusalem, for Noah Hutchins and myself, Maranatha.